The sea around the newfound land is rich beyond belief, the early explorers said when they triumphantly returned from their western voyages. And true enough it was. But when the ice swept down from the north to choke the bays, it didn't matter how rich the waters were. Men couldn't fish through ice 20 feet thick. And in those days, there were neither supermarkets nor unemployment checks to tide you over the winter. But nature was kind, for with the ice came the seals, a welcome source of meat after the long, lean days of winter and a source of fur and oil. Harp seals were most numerous. They'd swim south ahead of the ice, and then when time came to give birth to their white-coated pups, they'd head back to the ice fields. The settlers in our northern bays grew to depend on seals. It became part of our way of life. In the summer and fall you fished, in the winter and spring you hunted the seal. But I've used the wrong word, for it's only in recent years that Newfoundlanders would say seal hunt. To our fathers it was the seal fishery. Seals came from the sea and were part of it. In later years, seal meat became a bit of a treat, a delicacy. To an earlier generation, it was a necessity. And so, down through the years, when most Newfoundland mothers wouldn't dare serve anything but fish on a Friday, even the most devout could eat away at a meal of seal flippers. But the tradition of eating seal is one thing, the tradition of going to the ice, another. It was a specialized trade of our northern men. It started way back in the 1700s, when small schooners began to venture among the offshore ice pans. Then, as skippers gained in experience, they tried bigger wooden vessels and massive crews. Sheathed in Greenheart, their vessels made remarkable voyages among the ice fields. Gradually, steam replaced sail and steel replaced wood. But the men, the sealers, were the same. Tough northern men who continued to go for the same reasons their fathers went, to earn money at a slack time of year. But it was really more than that. It was, and I suppose still is, a gamble, an adventure, a test of manhood. Oh, well, not the killing of seals itself. That was incidental to the voyage. It was the excitement, the danger, the camaraderie. But it wasn't easy. It was hard, back-breaking work under unbelievably severe conditions. And there were often tragedies. Today on land and sea, we're going back to that era, to the time when any northern man worth his salt would fight for a berth to the ice. So now here's Hal Andrews' program of a few years back, the story of the Newfoundland disaster as recalled by veteran sealer Cecil Moland. This is the east coast of Newfoundland. From the sea behind me comes the fish that for hundreds of years has formed the economic backbone of this island. It's also from the sea that the great Arctic seal herds ride the ice flows south on their annual migration. The seal, too, can take its rightful place in the history of Newfoundland. Tonight's program is not to defend the seal hunt that's been so hotly contested both locally and internationally for the past few years, but to better explain why, for the past several hundred years, there's been a seal fishery in Newfoundland at all. By mid-March, the front is cold and green as it nears the Funk Islands off the northeast coast. Relentlessly, it has been pushed and pulled south by the Labrador Current and the polar pack ice. South to its eventual death in the warmer waters off the Grand Banks. But before the ice completes its simple cycle, it must play host to a phenomenon as deeply rooted in the lore and tradition of Newfoundland as is the common codfish. Somewhere ahead lies the main patch, thousands of them, seals, harp seals and hoods, fluffy brown-eyed white coats, newborn and helpless, laden with rich fat and cloaked with a very precious skin. Seals worth a handsome price to the furriers and oil merchants of Europe and North America. 
This scene has been lived and relived every March since the early 1700s. Sons, fathers, grandfathers, to the ice, and why? The reasons are as many and as varied as the number of young men who've slipped to their death in the frigid North Atlantic. Adventure, broken marriages, relief from the boredom of outport life, and of course, money. In the early days, only 50 or 60 dollars for six weeks of pure hell. And this would be the only money that the sealer and his family would see for the entire year. For right up into the 1950s, he lived by the barter system. His fish was traded for flour and fatback pork. Technology has changed things somewhat. The boats are made of steel and well equipped with radar and helicopters, and the men can now make 500 to 1,000 dollars in a shorter time. But the dirty work still remains basically the same. In recent years, public outcry against the hunt has obscured a tradition that is as rich in Canadian history and folklore as the original fur trade or the opening of the West. David Blackwood, well-known Canadian artist, comes from a Newfoundland family rich in the tradition of the seal hunt. It was a great, uh, great occasion, the uh, departure of the sealing uh, of fleet. Everybody in the city of St. John stopped what they were doing on that particular morning. And at a particular uh, time, the uh, ships uh, slowly left the uh, harbor um, to the tune of whistles and guns and any other sort of uh, noise that could be made. It was a very interesting uh, situation because um, there was not really a great deal of money involved. Um, at the peak period in the uh, 1930s, uh, a really good uh, voyage in some of the larger steel ships which came into uh, action around 1930, it was possible to make about $90 uh, for the season. Uh, as a result of the most uh, strenuous work you could possibly imagine, and the most dangerous in the world, surely. And every boy of 16 or 17 looked forward to the day when we would be able to go to the front. And uh, it was a great uh, uh, ritual of testing your manhood, actually, uh, whether or not you would be good for the rest of your life. It was a tradition before 1903 that you had to pay a fee, I believe it was $3, in order to get a place aboard one of the sealing ships. And there was a great strike known as the Sealer Strike, Great Sealer Strike of 1903, where the, uh, when the city of St. John's was jammed with sealers, and they threatened, and actually in one uh, situation pulled a ship right up on the main street and threatened to pull the entire fleet up into the harbor if this uh, fee was not abolished, and it was repealed. Now, the great national heroes, and I, I use the word national because Newfoundland at that time, of course, was a country. It was a nation, and uh, the uh, national heroes were the great sealing captains. Uh, not only were they sealing captains, but they represented their regions in the uh, House of Assembly. House of Assembly. Uh, when they were not uh, at sea, they were seated in the legislature. And in the case of Captain Kane, of course, he was a minister in the cabinet. And, uh, so this will give you some indication of how prominent they were. There's an interesting situation also in regards to the ships, which were not really in tip-top uh, shape. And uh, many of them were actually bought in Europe and were fixed up for a few thousand dollars and sent to the seal fishery uh, with the idea that if there's a good voyage, uh, you make a good profit. And in the meantime, if the ship is jammed or it's destroyed or catches fire, uh, the loss is not that great, and of course the men are not considered here, because if you lose the half of your crew or the entire crew of the ship, which happened, um, this could always be attributed to the very bad weather in that part of the country.
the uh, main objective of the sealing captain uh, was always to get uh, the largest number of seals possible. And in the case of Captain, uh, captain Abraham Kane, this was a very, uh, the main priority. Um, there were incredible situations where men were sent over the side in storms. Uh, the captain, aware of the fact that there was a tremendous patch of seals out there, and what are you going to do? Just sit around and wait for the uh, weather to clear up? You just couldn't afford to do that. You might, uh, for the rest of the voyage, the rest of the season, you might not uh, encounter seals, so you had to get them uh, when they were there. And uh, in many cases, uh, this, has, this resulted in disaster. And there were many. The Greenland disaster, 1898. The Southern Cross, 173 hands, 1914. And the steamship Newfoundland. The Newfoundland was wooden and 42 years old by the spring of 1914. Her young captain, Wes Kane, couldn't keep her up with the rest of the steel fleet in the race to the front. She was old, no wireless. His father's ship, the Stefano, cut the ice like a knife. But the old Newfoundland stuck fast, unable to reach the main patch of seals. This set the scene for one of our most bizarre natural dramas. 79-year-old Cecil Molan, now of St. John's, was a sealer on board the Newfoundland. Well, now, <clears throat> there's so much about the Newfoundland disaster that sometimes you, you hardly know where to begin. As you know, we, we uh, used to sail to the sail fishery around the 10th day of March, and uh, we leave St. John's uh, like I said many times before, and we sail north, go down through Bacaloo, Tickle, and all around there and until we go down around Fogel, down that way, and we'd hit the uh, Arctic ice. And then we'd uh, straighten her out for the seal fishery, with the, the real uh, Arctic ice, where the seals used to breed and drift along on the Newfoundland coast. Yeah, we young fellas wanted a dollar in our pocket. Not very often we had a dollar, so we figured if we go out there and make a bit of quick money, uh, well, you, you get a girl better those days. You had a couple of coppers in your pocket. <laughs> Something to rattle, that's all you want. <laughs> Conditions were real bad. If you want to know a little bit about it, the, the place we had to live was down in the hole, in the cargo hole, you know. We built our bunks up on the side like a roost. And we had no bunks, we had no mattress, we had nothing, nothing like that, only just the hard boards that you pick up around the ship to build your berth up on the side of the ship. And you use your clothes bag then, uh, what you had your clothes in for a pillow. The old Newfoundlander, she was, uh, she could only make about six knots in, in clear water. And we hit the Arctic ice and she got jammed tight. Captain Abram Kane told his son, Wesley, if he would get into the seals before he did, he would lift the main derrick, you know. Nobody else would notice that. The main derrick would come up straight. And uh, Captain Wiss was spying in the evening, and he saw the derrick go up straight. And then that evening, we made arrangements for the next morning to walk from the Newfoundland over to the Stephan to stay all night. It was a strenuous trek, up and around pressure ridges and pinnacles, hot sun for the time of year. Many neglected to carry their oil skins or normal winter clothing. There were premonitions and evil omens. 34 men turned back to the Newfoundland. There was a general uneasiness. 132 of the Newfoundland's men boarded the Stefano around lunchtime on Tuesday. Well, uh... We, we got on board the uh, Stefano, all right, and had a mug up, as they call it, uh, you know, had a mug up. And then uh, before we were finished, Abram came. Captain Abram was hollering out Newfoundland men over the side, you know. And that was the captain's orders, and we had to obey that. And it was snowing real bad. We was almost knee-deep now in snow. Keep the wind in the side of your face, and we'll make it before dark. We keep the wind in the side of our face as we walked along, you know. But the wind was changing. And then we keep 
you know. And uh, in the evening, then, when it got real late, we were walking away from the ship instead of going toward her. I kept in the wind inside your face. Was, uh, you see, we should have had a compass, look, and set the course, you know, and keep walking straight. But we didn't know the wind was changing because nobody had a compass out. There were six fellers died uh, the first night. Maybe more than that. I know six fellers died because they got in the, in the water, look, and got wet. Some of them, anyway. And when you pulled them out, uh, they never, they couldn't move no more. That cold water just chilled them and uh, stunned them or killed them. Right off. It was uh, vicious then, all that night. And then all the next day, Wednesday, was terrific. You, you couldn't see anything for snow and drift, you know. And blown, uh, a north wind was blown, and it was, the snow was very frosty. Frost was in the snow and just curling up. And uh, Wednesday night, that was the last night we were out. There were two nights and almost three days. Wednesday night was zero, and uh, that's when the men died. They was dying all day Wednesday. I used to see them, you know, topple over, and uh, and they would, uh, when they fall on the ice, they would never move no more. Same as though they were just frozen even before they fell. We uh, used to march around in single file, you know, to keep warm. March around, and then uh, we'd pound each other on the back, this way. Bang, bang, bang. Keep you warm, you know, keep the blood circulating. And uh, then we would uh, uh, march around until we get tired, and then we'd huddle up together, and everybody would try to get in the middle. It was warmer in there, but uh, nobody got in there, I don't think. <laughs> the minute you were there, you was outside, in and out. So we... Uh, Keep on uh, marching, and uh, then uh, somebody say, uh, like uh, Uncle Jess Collins from Air Bay, we go fishing, make believe fishing, you know, and all that helped to keep us warm. Well, <laughs> I just didn't want to die. Well, nobody wanted to die, but I made up my mind that uh, I uh, I wanted to live anyway, so long as I could. But uh, some of the fellers died and didn't want to die, you know. They'd get down on the ice and talk and groan and struggle and try to get up again, but they never get up no more. So I, I never, I wasn't off my feet, not, not, never, not one minute while I was out there, two nights and almost three days. I wore out a brand new pair of boots, almost to the inner soles. Uncle Ab Tibbet from Catalina, him and his two sons, Uncle, the boys, uh, Uncle Ab, uh, knew that they were getting pretty shaky. And he got them around him and threw his arms around him and, you know, like father, father's love and hugged the boys and tried to keep them warm. And they were standing, you know, all out, out they would stand up this way. And, and that's how they died. The one son there and the one there and the old man over there this way. And that's the way they put them on board the Bill of Venture, frozen together, because the, they, they couldn't do anything uh, with them. If they did, they would break the bones and break them all up in pieces, you know. And then there was another man from Ellison. Uh, his son lay down to die, and the old man lay down with him and pulled out his old Guernsey and got the boys ate up under the Guernsey and hugged the boy this way, and that's the way they froze out there on the ice. It was uh, sad uh, to look at. And a lot of the fellers were drifted in with the snow. You could see their hand up to the snow or their air blown or something, you know, where they drifted in with the snow. I saw men uh, that time, and I listened to them, you know, when they kneeled down uh, on the ice, uh, you know, this way. And uh, they, uh, you know, they prayed their last prayer, and I suppose some of them probably prayed their first one. And that's the way they died, this way looking up towards heaven, you know, and saying their last prayer. We sang all the hymns that we knew in the book. There's a land that is fairer than they, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there.
was an incredible storm, one of the worst that decade. Two nights and almost three days, the men were on the ice. Thursday morning was a beautiful morning, and wherever we looked, we, we could see a ship, you know. And uh, sometimes the ships would be coming toward us, and then sometimes they'd be going from us. And uh, me and another fellow, Tom Molan from Bonavista, walked towards uh, Bella Venture and put a flag up. The tragic irony of the situation lay in the fact that for the duration of the storm, neither of the captains had a clue that the men were missing. West Kane of the Newfoundland, stuck tight in the ice without a wireless, retired each night confident his men were safely aboard his father's ship. Abram Kane had ordered the crew of the Newfoundland to pan seals and return to their own ship. There was no doubt in his mind that they hadn't all made it back safely to the Newfoundland. It was the Barrel Watch on the Bella Venture, another ship in the fleet, that first spotted a handful of men struggling towards the ship early on Thursday morning. But uh, when the men did come, it was a happy time, and uh, I joined up with uh, two of the Bella Venture's men. First, he brought us uh, plenty of hard tack, you know, <laughs> and uh, I never had strength in my jaws to, to crack the bread, and I had to spit it out again. We got on board the, the Bella Venture and we were well taken care of there. They had two doctors on board and uh, they took good care of us there. The twisted, frozen bodies of those less fortunate came home piled on the deck of the Bella Venture. Seventy-nine men frozen to death. This is a story told, or a dream that belonged to a dim, mad past, of a March night and a north wind's cold, of a voyage home with a flag half-mast, of 20,000 seals that were killed to help to lower the price of bread. that followed, several official inquiries into the causes of the disaster were held. No real blame was laid anywhere, but to this day the public has held Captain Abram Kane to be responsible. Was it Kane, or was it not the system that placed the value of the seal skins higher than the lives of the men who hunted them? I like to sit by the big black stone Watch the kid la bailin Daddy's gonna buy me a brand new dress When the boys come home from Swyland Since we first telecast this program a few years ago, the seal fishery has been turned into an international three-ring circus. We hope that today's retelling of Cecil Molan's dramatic story will serve to remind us of what sealing really meant to an earlier generation. That's Land and Sea for this week. We'll be back again Wednesday next at the same time. Good night. <laughs>